ElectroCast. Hold music. You want to avoid it, and so do your customers. So say goodbye to hold music and hello to faster, smarter support with Salesforce. Make service more personal and agents more productive using built-in trusted AI. Then watch costs and wait times drop and satisfaction soar. Support customers in a whole new way with Service GPT. Learn how at salesforce.com slash service GPT. Welcome to Nature Backed Podcast of Single Earth. In this series, we are talking with investors about the vision of the new green world. My name is Tarmo Virki, and in this episode 8, I'm talking with Urja Oyasar from Change Ventures on Baltic startup scene and how he will be looking for further investments in the climate sector. Enjoy the show. Thanks, Urja, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's uh, to start off. Uh, let's uh, discuss a little bit what is Change uh, Ventures, how it was born, and what's the story behind it. Oh, you know, like with every venture fund, it's it's uh, it's one of those weird uh, uh, origin stories uh, because it didn't start out at all like a normal um, European venture fund. In fact, it started out as an American venture fund. Uh, Change Ventures One is a Delaware fund. Uh, 100% American money. Um, and so uh, it, it, it is not your typical fund where there's, you know, EIF, EBRD, government monies, etc. Uh, but it was the fastest way for us to get started also. So um, we were able to uh, get going with, with essentially like a starter fund, uh, 6.5 million, um, make some investments. We ended up making nine investments. Uh, and uh, based on the results of fund one, then we we ended up raising uh, fund two, which is a European fund, much more uh, traditional in the vein of the European funds, where we have a lot of institutional investors, including EIF, EBRD, um, Finnish, uh, uh, Latvian, Italian, German, UK institutional investors, uh, and uh, about... 50 million or so. We're the largest uh, seed fund in the Baltics now. What's the investment logic? What kind of companies you're uh, targeting? Well, it, the our tagline essentially is investing in ambitious Baltic founders. And the thing that, that we do differently really is that we look at Baltic founders. Um, that's essentially our geographic focus. These are the founders that me and my partners know the best. Uh, when we looked at the average time that we know founders before investment, it ended up being um, in the medians over four years. Uh, so we've seen these guys do maybe one, two projects already, um, often you know failing at, at the first or the second one, and only then we invest. Um, so so that's a different type of approach than than some of these other funds in the Baltics that are looking at all of Europe or uh, maybe our, our specialist in terms of deep tech or something like that. We're generalist, but the one common denominator is that there's a Baltic founder core to mm. all of them. Uh, and, and that's sort of our specialty. Mm. And there is such thing as Baltic, as you know, Estonians, we really don't like to be Baltic. Well, yeah, I, I think, but we should be, I think we should be more proud of it okay. uh, because the Baltics actually has its own um flavor uh and 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 it's an advantage uh because first of all all the baltic startups i think are uh born global in the sense that they right away recognize that look you know this is not we have no home market this is not a market that you can build a business on there's not enough uh, people territory markets money uh talent uh, and from day one, you have to be looking at international uh, international markets like the U.S., U.K., Africa, or, or you know any other market for that matter. So um, I think we do have some some very special traits uh, for startups here, and I I don't think we should be ashamed of it. In fact, part of the reason why I think the Baltics have been so successful is because we have our own path instead of trying to be 
mini Stockholm, or instead of trying to be kind of Berlin or sort of London, you know, let's go with what we're good at. Um, and, and let's be proud of that and not try to play uh, someone else's game. Uh, my partner Wright has, I think, the best analogy for this. If you remember uh, a movie called Cool Runnings, it was the Jamaican bobsled team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were successful not trying to be the Swiss bobsled team uh, to replicate, you know, the Swiss or the Swedes or the Austrians. They really were good at being themselves. And, and I think it's the same way. The Baltics really should play themselves, not trying to be someone that they're not. Mm. Cool. That's uh, that's a, and uh, you guys, uh, you right uh, and some of the other Andres. guys and and Andres. Andres is in uh, Riga, right? That's correct. Uh, how do you cover Lithuania? We have a senior associate, a okay. superb uh, senior associate, Gabriele, uh, in Lithuania in Vilnius, and uh, she covers so uh, she covers all of that market. So we have uh, all of the. Baltics to represent it. And again, that's an advantage that we have to where we literally have people in every single Baltic state instead of trying to do it all remotely from Tallinn or remotely from Vilnius. Mm. Let's go a little bit deeper into what we are doing here at the Nature Back, uh, you know, talking about climate and uh, tell a few words about, you know, what have been your first investments in anything climate related? We have uh, so far, we have made. Uh, four investments that I think are directly related to the climate. Others may be indirectly, but those that are directly, um, uh, one from Fund One, that's Timbetter, uh, and it is a way of measuring uh, industrial timber, cut timber, basically. Uh, very exciting project. We can get more into details of how they're changing the world and what impact they're having. Uh, but then from Fund Two, we have uh, three investments so far. Air Rounds, which uh, works on um, uh, wind turbines uh, and cleaning and repairing wind turbines. Quota, which uh, uh, mints and uh, verifies and trades in carbon credits. Um, and we have Gelatex, which is an alternative meat uh, startup. Mm. Gelatex pivoted, right? I remember they were doing something leather related. That, that's right. Um, it was it was related uh, to the space because they were trying to replace leather with gel based uh, materials. Mm. Um, and in in typical startup fashion, they were looking at these different um, opportunities and where their technology could be used best. And they realized that, wow, in this alternative meat space, there's a real challenge. Um, we can make uh, pate, uh, essentially, but most people don't like the consistency of pate. When they're looking for a burger or when they're looking for a steak, they're looking for that mouth feel. And what I mean by mouth feel is literally the feeling in your mouth as you're biting into the meat they, there's a certain specific feeling and sensation you get in your mouth from, you know, the structure of the meat. Um, and that's been the holy grail of that industry is trying to achieve not just that the flavor or the color is the same, but also the sensation, the mouthfeel of the meat. And uh, their technology is able to create these um, scaffolds or these layers that meat has, right? Mm. Um, and so when you bite into a steak made with their technology, it actually feels like steak. Mm. How far are they? When can we go to a restaurant and order a gelatex steak? Well, um, you know, experimental basis, you know, one-off basis already. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working with some of the largest uh, alternative meat manufacturers in the world, and they're already selling product to them. And, and so it's already possible to do that. Uh, but in terms of uh, going to your local grocery store and buying these steaks, I think it's still a good, you know, three to five years away. Mm. Uh, quota, just recently, you guys published, uh, was it the pre-seed round of uh, 1.5 million? 
Yes, that's right. Quota, we we just came public with that announcement and it was a fairly large uh, pre-seed, one of the largest pre-seeds in this region. Mm. The uh, I think the idea that the guys come from the recycling industry, the, the kind of garbage industry or what is it called these days, um, and uh, start to environmental build. Oh, yeah, waste right. Or, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, waste. Waste is the the word I think uh, most yes. people would recognize, uh, and uh, start to build uh, basically a new uh, a new world up on this. Absolutely, and and that's what got me. Uh, well, a couple of things that got me really excited about this, and I was the deal champion for our fund mm. on quota. Was one that the founders weren't just nineteen year olds going, "Hey, you know, we're going to disrupt everything. We're going to do everything differently." Uh, well, they don't even know yet what they're changing. Um, these guys have been working on C-level positions in uh, Ragnar Sells, one of the you know mm. the really large waste uh, and environmental uh, services companies in the world from Sweden. Um, and so they really, really knew this industry. They knew how recycling is being done currently. And from that knowledge, recognized what could be changed, what should be done differently and better. Uh, so that got me excited. Um, and then um, as I dug deeper into this um, carbon credit space, uh, I became very interested. Um, I became very interested in the economics of it. And it looked like the current carbon credit space is broken. And the easiest way to understand why or how it's broken is that 80% of the money from these credits goes to consultants, to the people setting up the tokens, verifying them over 10 years, going back and forth, and you know all of the procedures and, and, and all of the diligence and all of the, the uh, trading and all of that was eating up the money. So that only 20% ended up actually with those that were creating um, you know, these credits. So Quota flips that economics of that um, from you know 80 20 to 20 80 to where 20 goes to consultants and 80 actually ends up with the projects now mm -hmm. and with that they're hoping to dramatically increase recycling so mm -hmm. that recycling becomes uh, competitive with use of virgin materials mm -hmm. really, really really cool project this 80 percent though sounds like crazy right I mean, well, is, you know, is there any it, other it, industry where eighty percent goes to consultant? I mean, in a, in I addition to lawyers? consultancy, I don't, right? <laughs> I mean, when no, actually, even there, um, in most deals, you know, lawyers account to you know five percent or ten percent at the most of an IPO or a deal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense with traditional carbon credits. Most of them are based on either. Um, on land projects, whether that's land for agriculture or land with timber use. So you make the promise that, look, I'm not going to cut down these trees for 10 years. So for 10 years in the middle of the rainforest somewhere in Brazil, somebody has to go and verify regularly. Are, are, have the trees been cut? You know, how are they being grown? How what's what kind of harvesting is happening in this space? Or with agriculture, you know, are they using organic materials? How have they really changed? How has the soil chemistry changed over 10 years? Well, this is, you know, quite cumbersome and takes a long time. And it's a very involved process uh, because uh, quota guys are addressing recycling. First of all, it's not in the middle of a rainforest in uh, South America or in Africa. You know, it's at whatever recycling facility in any country. And these facilities are quite compact. And using modern IoT solutions, you know, having cameras on the facility mm. and using all the data that already a recycling facilities are having to give to their customers and to the government, they can really cut that 80% to the 20% for verifications. So it's an entirely different model of verifying how new um, recycling is happening and therefore how these uh, credits are uh, uh, controlled and verified, bringing a lot of transparency to this industry. Mm. The, uh, I mean, is there anybody else kind of creating uh, carbon credits based on recycling? Would they, are they the guys who are building the standard? or? Uh, 
I think they're going to be one of the leaders in the industry. I mean, some recycling credits are already being done. Some of these are not on the voluntary carbon credit market. Uh, most of these projects are actually related you know, to the government projects, and it's a different carbon credits market when, when governments are buying and selling them. Uh, but in the voluntary uh, space, there really are uh, pioneers. They're the leaders in this space. And we believe that um, you know, while forest and agriculture is about 100, um, uh, you know, make up, well, not quite 100 percent, but let's say 90 percent or 85 percent of the market, then quota is going to uh, increase the that their shareholding in terms of um, credits coming from recycling from one or two percent to 20, 30 percent or more. Mm, that's very cool. Uh, when you look at the projects, uh, you know, on your table, how do you how do you treat climate? Is it somehow different compared to I don't know, fintech or SaaS or what's the kind of the climate role in your investment decisions? Um, to be to be uh, very direct, I would say there is no difference because we are not an impact fund. So we have not told our investors that, look, you know, we're going to make investments and impact or environment will be a big part of our decision making. So a project gets extra points for having more impact or extra points for having a larger impact on the environment. So for our fund, we've always told um, our, our investors who gave us money that we look at all projects equally. You know, whatever is the best project wins. Right. Mm-hmm. That's where we put money. That's where we are different from impact funds. Mm. All of these investments I mentioned, Timbetter, Irons, Quota, Gilatex, we invested on the fundamentals. Uh, we invested on what we see as an opportunity to do something revolutionary and therefore bring back revenues to our investors. So um, in terms of modeling, in terms of the economics of it, these for us there is no difference mm. do you see the kind of uh, amount of uh, such projects increasing from the also from you know as you're looking at the baltics i i guess 10 years ago there was not much of uh, environmental or climate related projects in in our region now you have four in the portfolio and there's plenty more on the market how do you see the trend absolutely the trend is increasing and and i think that's very positive uh, there's a there's been uh, this this overall world sort of uh, trend where we have externalized uh, the environmental issue to where um, we don't take into account what is the effect, the long term effect on society, on on carbon, on uh, availability of materials, on prices, on any of that. It's sort of been accepted as well, that's we'll put that down for a zero. And that's why virgin materials and use of brand new materials and digging up new materials all the time has been price competitive. We have now realized that, well, the cost is not zero. In fact, with, you know, rising water levels, with changing climates, you know, with additional um, new dangers and risks coming from forest fires, from flooding, from uh, much stronger storms, all of these factors actually do have a specific cost. It may be difficult to directly calculate, but uh, it's starting to be more and more quantified uh, objectively. And um, in that sense, I think we are, as a as as a society, we're becoming more aware of it, and we're being more uh, careful in making those calculations. Um, that creates an opportunity for a lot of environmental projects that 10 years ago, nobody would have maybe looked at mm-hmm. and would have just scoffed at, oh, well, you know, that's a nice to have, but it's starting to be a must have. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these solutions we're realizing that are absolutely necessary um, for us and, and this planet. And uh, therefore, they're becoming economically viable. Mm-hmm. And uh, this trend is uh, basically happening at the same time when, uh, when the world kind of the, the glo- globally the world is changing. So uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a good point that uh, 
it kind of puts the uh, the climate or impact related companies actually on the same line with the with a I don't know classical startups uh, kind of equals equals the starting point so to say. I, yes, I, I agree. I think uh, there's a, there's a certain leveling of the playing field in the sense that these environmental or impact investments were looked at originally as as these a special category, almost like you know a do good type of project, mm. uh, almost like you know like an NGO thing, mm. instead of a real economic venture uh, scale uh, thing. And that's changed, and that that's changed for the better. Um, and and there's like you said, there's a bunch of really interesting projects in the Baltics as well. Um, uh, quite a few exciting new ways that people are looking at uh, recycling of textiles, you know, fast fashion, and and trying to address some of the very serious problems related to those industries. Um, and addressing them in a reasonable economic financial way so that also um, those that invest into these projects uh, can make a profit. As an investor in the, in, the, in the Baltic region, I have to ask, the, the 2014-15 wars in Ukraine had a very little impact. Do you see the current war having a bigger impact on the investment climate? Um. Absolutely. In the, in the long run, for sure. In the short run, everybody's sort of in this let's wait and see holding pattern, kind of. Um, let's see what Russia does. Let's see how Europeans react to it. Uh, but on the positive side, I definitely see that trends that maybe would have taken 10, 15, maybe 20 years uh, to push through are now going to go through in 90% less time, maybe in three years. Um, and what I'm talking about here is people realizing that LNG uh, might be more reasonable um, uh, than than just buying endlessly uh, energy from, from Russia or OPEC uh, from the Middle East. Uh, I think solar, wind, those technologies uh, are going to have a much faster rollout and, and more energy, more more investment, more attention dedicated to them, uh, and they're going to be much faster in scaling. Um, so so there's going to be, I think, positive impacts in the long run. And the same, of course, with uh, electric vehicles and, and alternative energy uh, vehicles, and even you know cold fusion and things like that. They're all going to get a boost from trying to unhook ourselves from the traditional petrochemical type of industry, mm, kind of uh, removing the what's the what's the cl- beautiful word in English, the tit or the, the <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. I think we've been um, and and I maybe that Germany is the the most obvious example of this. We've been really hooked mm. on this cheap energy, of course. But it's it's kind of it's been like getting energy from coffee instead of sleeping exercising and eating well like oh you know i'll just have one more espresso one more espresso yeah and you get this quick boost and 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 you need another quick boost and you need another quick boost but how long can you keep going without changing the fundamentals because the fundamentals are wrong if all you're doing is surviving on espresso right you're doing something wrong you know with the with your basic premises uh and the same way i think environmentally We've been using these hacks and shortcuts and the cheap ways of doing, um, but cheap only in the short run. That's because cheap, it's been cheap because we've, we're externalizing again the real cost. Mm. Uh, we've been writing a zero where there's actual cost, but we're pretending like there isn't. Mm. Uh, I think the pretending has stopped uh, for a lot of people related to the war. Mm. Uh, they weren't able to pretend anymore that there is no cost. There's a very serious, real cost to these things. Cool. Uh, you know, something positive out of the tra- tra- tragedy. So Absolutely. it's it's, it's all, all, always, uh, you know, always good to find those things. The uh, Looking into the this, this year, kind of uh, going forward, do you have any kind of... Uh, 
I don't know, big big vision or target or what will the 2022 look for you? Well, we we still have investments to be made uh, from our uh, fund two, um, and and we're looking continuing to look at uh, very exciting uh, Baltic startups. It is great to see how from um, the transfer wise from pipe drive a lot of the senior people aren't taking their money and running off to the you know bahamas or something and or buy, buying islands and 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 living somewhere in the caribbean but instead are going to the next project the next project uh and and at the same time even serving on boards of other companies and helping you know third and fourth companies with with their uh challenges so, so my hat's off to all of those entrepreneurs that don't just, you know, one shot, I win, boom, I'm out, uh, but are paying it forward, are really helping this ecosystem and are, are, are doing, you know, their part in actually continuing this growth uh, and the success story that the Baltics uh, really are writing themselves. So, so thank you, uh, all, all of those people. It's great to see, you know, the honey badgers, all the pipe drive guys investing, you know, um, Risto and, and, and all of the transfer wise people investing and also, you know, taking part in projects and, and the old OGs as well. You know, it's great to see how things are going, um, for, for all the Skype guys, you know, and, and seeing how Starship is doing and, and those projects. Uh, successfully raising money and innovating as well. Mm, cool. I think that's a good point to wrap it up. Thanks, Surya. Thank you for having me. Um, and and I look forward to making more investments in this space and maybe I'll come back to talk about them with you. Absolutely. we Will do. Cheers. Bye-bye. Join us again for the next episode. Thank you for listening. If you like the show, please give us a good rating and leave the feedback in your podcast player so others will find it too. We will be back next week. Turn on to Nature Back Podcast. Welcome to Abracadabra, Create What You Speak, the podcast that combines spirituality with creativity. Here, guests from around the world share their stories and insights on navigating life's challenges through art, music, and creative expression. Connect to yourself, others, and the world through empowering conversations viewed through a spiritual lens. I'm Ilana Zulai, your host, a spiritual mentor, and a sound therapist. Electric acid. Are you a fan of classic cinema or a young person who wants to discover the best films of all time? Do these legendary movies still hold up? On the Generation Film Podcast, two guys who grew up when movies dominated the culture share a great film with a panel of young movie lovers and see how it plays for today's generation. We discuss changes in storytelling styles, representation, the making of each film, its initial reception, and how its meaning has changed over the years. Join us as we explore cinema classics across generations on Generation Film. Electric acid. Electric acid.